Hey, welcome to Johnny Angel's Ginchy Stuff and Music Museum. We're here today reminiscing and talking about music. Nothing but music. And this is my partner, Byron Nash. Hey, everybody. And, and what we're going to do right now is just a little bit of talking about the gigs, right? Yeah. I, I want to ask you, you just come off a string of gigs. I mean, yeah. I think you did like four in a row or something like that. Five. Five in a row? Yeah. So, so what I want you to do is just, just tell me how pe how you get the word out now. How do you... How do you it's kind of different. You know, the number one thing that people ask me, they're like, where can I find your music? Like, yeah. are you on Spotify? Are you on that? And, you know, while I've been around for a long time, the dynamic of how you get music out is so different. So before it was like you try to get signed, try to get a record out, try to get it on a label, all those things. But now you can literally record a song at home, pretty much mix it and put it out <laughs> yeah, yourself, and yeah. then get it on these music platforms. And that's how the listener takes your music now. So, you know, the days of needing to put out a full album, don't really, you don't oh, have to you. do that. Um, yeah. You can put out three songs and people are just happy that you have something yeah. because you could churn it out a little more. So it's not as heavily dependent on radio. I kind of look at those platforms as radio, you know, for the yeah, independent for, artists. So what was it like for you with like radio? Mine was the exact opposite. Mm. It was like, uh, you're, you're a band and you want to get something out there so that people can hear you and you go in the studio and you cut your first record. Okay? Yeah. And on that record, now you have to have AR people that can actually get out there and meet the, uh, the disc jockeys and the radio stations and try to sell it. And the small label you start on probably isn't the label you want to be on when it's over. Yeah. We were a small label here in Pittsburgh. It was called Steeltown Sound Records. And um, our record now is, is very valuable because it's an oldie. And they're selling it over in Europe now, right? But yeah. in the day, I mean, we'd go to different radio stations and ask them if they would play it. And luckily, we had friends in the business that would play our record. And, and then you could go to National Record Mart and buy a copy of it. <laughs> you know? What's really interesting is, um, you know, the, the way the industry was set up, it's sort of like there were more gatekeepers. So if you couldn't get to that label or get to that A&R person, if, as an artist, you kind of didn't know how to do it. And yeah. without them, you couldn't get there. Now you can go directly to your fans, which yep. is an element that I do like about it because now they can decide if they like your music. Absolutely. You know, so it's kind of an interesting um, transfer of power in a way. You know, I think the, the artist is more empowered these days. Absolutely. And you also have quicker access to your audience, which we couldn't. We, any type way we get in touch with people that listen to our music was here in concert, and that's it. Mm. There was, it couldn't put it on, hey, come hear me tonight at the so-and-so. You had to look at your newspaper and say, hey, we're playing at the such-and-such -such club. You yeah. know what I mean? It was a little different. Fun fact, in 1941, do you know uh, the first FM radio station started in Nashville, Tennessee? 1941? Yeah. Well, that's funny because, you know, FM to me was brand new. Yeah. <laughs> no, but AM was what I used to, little transistor radio. Oh, wow, and, yeah. I remember in, those, actually. And the guy that I knew in Pittsburgh, was Porky Chedwick and mm. Porky Chedwick is in my opinion he's the guy that broke the race barrier in music for us uh, he's a disc jockey it was on WAMO okay. and um, he promoted all rhythm and blues music right so growing up on my AM radio I listened to Pat Boone and uh, things that I didn't yeah. really appreciate at the time you know but then I got a transistor radio, and I heard Porky Chedwick the first time telling me about rhythm and blues, wow. talking about Wyoming, and talking about James Brown, and talking about, and I'm like, whoa, and hearing that music for the first time. So it grew into FM, but yeah. the, the AM up, up front, and I have a radio show now, which has changed again. So my radio show now is probably known worldwide because it's on the internet. Mm, again, yeah, exactly. So yeah. two worlds coming yes. together, right? And it really connected for me, you know. Nice. So coming from the older area, uh, I don't mean it like that, like the older style of how music was heard, received, put yes. out, where was your transition and kind of bridging the gap with how you did it to now you're on the internet to reach more people? Yes. Where, where, what was the clicking point for you to say, okay, you know what, I need to do this to reach more? Yeah, I, I think what, what happened is when, when our band became very popular and we knew we weren't signed to a major label, but yet we were working with a lot of people who were major labels. Mm -hmm. And we were very lucky because we were able to be with our heroes, the ones that had big records. And so our name could be associated with them in some way. So that got the word out. And then I got into radio in addition to my band. So I've been on the radio here in Pittsburgh several times. I was in the morning show, uh, 3WS, I was on with those guys. Then I was on WZUM with Mad Mike Metro, and we had mm. our own show. And then I was on WJAS here in Pittsburgh. I had my Sunday night show. Oh, wow. And then That's I was picked lot. up by the internet. But then before, only the people that could tune into our, our stations could hear me, Pittsburgh. Right. But now, world. 
I talk now and I have people in Florida, I have people in New York, I have people in the UK, you know what I yeah. mean? So the arm has reached so much further. I love it, I love it. You know, in my day, I depended on radio. Do you listen to radio at all? Um, I don't listen to the radio now, but um, growing up, it, it did play a major role in how I received my music. Okay. I was fortunate that my mom had a crazy you know, record collection I had access there, but everything else, when I started to be my own independent listener, I mean, it was like B94, Whammo, and I remember, you know, you had to sit and kind of wait and hope they played your song and <laughs> capture it. And so I would build my own mixtapes off of the radio because uh, okay. that was the only way for me to have, um, you know, the music of the artist that I maybe couldn't afford or we didn't have in the house. Uh, and another thing that I actually did, I used to record off of my television, MTV, some of my favorite videos came on. I would build cassettes that way. So it was sort of like using radio, using video to sure. just kind of find artists. And then I became sort of really an independent listener where radio wasn't giving me enough. And so yeah. I would find out things through, you know, magazines and things like that. Absolutely. But I definitely, I grew up on radio and depended heavily on it, you know, for those uh, formative years of being a music listener, you know. Radio was our tool. I mean, without yeah. radio, we couldn't have functioned, right? Yeah. And, and, and today, uh, things have changed so much. And today, what I want to do is talk a little bit about uh, who's coming up next. Okay. All right. Uh, I have a dear old friend. Uh, this young man, when he first started, he was in college, right? And uh, I managed this group for a, a small amount of time. And, okay. and now I'm watching him grow and where he is on the, it's starting to break on the national scene, which we're going to bring him up. Right. It's my buddy Mark Ferrari. And you got to meet him, man. And, Looking uh, forward to it. And we got to sit here and chat a little bit about him. But we'll Maybe we right should do some jamming. Jack, Jack in the Box. It's time for Jack in the Box. This week, I am going to feature one of my icon people, one of the great icons of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Who is it? Bill Mazeroski, Pittsburgh Pirates. We're going to go back to 1960. This album is the actual recording of Bob Prince announcing the last inning of the World Series Pittsburgh Pirates versus the New York Yankees. Now, what's great about that? Because, you see, here I am, I'm in transition. It's between the 50s and the 60s. 1960s just rolling me right into a new decade, right? I'm loving music, I'm loving sports, and I'm loving my Pittsburgh Pirates. So I have my transistor radio, and I'm listening to the game, right? Now, Bill Mazeroski comes up after Hal Smith just hit a home run to tie the ball game up. Now, Bill Mazeroski comes up. He's playing against... One of the greats, right? The New York Yankees. Now, here he comes, ready to hit the ball, maybe a single, maybe get a bug on a rug, who knows? In fact, Bill Mazeroski hits a home run. I'm talking about over, over the scoreboard here at, at Forbes Field, right? 1960, and, and who's playing left field? Well, usually he's a catcher. The guy I'm talking about, Yogi Berra, but he was playing left field, and the picture I have of Yogi watching Bill Mazeroski's ball, Go over the wall. <clears throat> 1960, Pittsburgh Pirates, world champs, defeated the New York Yankees. I'm loving it. Hey, everybody. So we have Mark on the show. Mark, you know, we played kind of in a similar realm before, but tell mm -hmm. me, you know, a bit about what's going on with you musically. Well, um, I've been playing out a lot. I'm a singer-songwriter here based in Pittsburgh, and been having a lot of shows lately, opening up for some national acts. And I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, so finally... You know, starting to get that recognition and, and that validation from some of those artists, is, it's been great. But, you know, I've been local my whole life and, you know, I had a fallback plan in the beginning. My dad and my parents were always like, you know, go to college, get that, get that degree, get the teaching job. And, and I did all that, but music was just always pulling me back. It was just, it was just always there, you know, like an addiction, really. It was just always, I was always distracted with it. You know, in a good way. Okay. You know, and it's just. And before never I go back, because you know I like the old stuff, right? Mm -hmm. when, I, when I go back, uh, before we do that, tell everybody a little bit about some of the national acts you've just worked with. Well, um, just recently, um, I opened up for John Waite, who I was, nice. I was a huge fan of him. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I was a, just a young kid, I loved the song "Missing You." Yeah. And one of my favorite movies back then was Vision Quest, and the song "Change" was in that movie. And when I see you smile, and so getting to meet him. There's, I have a picture from the show where someone sent it to me where he's looking over the balcony watching me play. Oh, oh And they wow. sent that to me right when I came off stage. It was <laughs> awesome. And, you know, he played with Ringo Starr. You know, yeah. And he, so he, you know, he's and Paul McCartney was the reason he started playing bass. Yes. You know, and so just to, just to meet him, 
um, know that he was in the building listening to my music. Uh, it was just, those are the moments, you know. You know those, I worked with um, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, right? But you worked with the guy who played Jerry Lee Lewis. I did, right? Oh, wow. right? Yeah, yeah. Before, <laughs> before John Wade, I did a show with Dennis Quaid. Mm. And that, that was awesome. You know, he, he comes in, he has a little bulldog with him on stage while he's doing his sound check. What I respected so much about Dennis Quaid, he carried his own keyboards and he carried his own guitars. In. He was on the stage just like he was doing his own gig, like at a bar where you're wiring everything up and, you know, and he's looking around. It was, it was awesome. And I like that. Yeah. And we got, we got to talk. He asked about, you know, what do I do? What kind of music do I write? What do I play? And even at the end of the night, um, our SUVs were backed up against each other. Both of the hatches were up. I'm loading my gear in. He's loading <laughs> his gear in, you know? And it was just insane. And it was just like, it was awesome. And, you know. It's the real deal. It is. It's, and, you know, he's the actor, obviously, you know, Hollywood star, he's an amazing, amazing actor. <laughs> but to see that he has such a love for music, yeah. that's where we connected. It was just like, he was just like you, just like you, just yeah. like me on that level Absolutely. you're writing you're putting stuff out there and you hope you connect with people and that's what he's doing and, and for someone of his clout to get out there he's really putting himself out there to yeah. be you know yeah. either ridiculed or loved and so I, I give i admire him for even doing that well you know i'd like to go back to where we first met in mm -hmm. fact I, I, w I don't know if you can catch us or not but see this picture here <laughs> see this guy here in the middle <laughs> no here's even a better shot of him here had a lot of hair there <laughs> Right there. <laughs> now, if you know me, you just know <laughs> if that's the look. But it, it's kind of crazy because uh, I met these guys when they were going to uh, IUP, right? Mm -hmm. IUP. Yep. And um, they, they start, had this great a cappella group, and uh, they st started to sing at my restaurant. And uh, a couple times they opened for us, and uh, we did a couple shows together. That's where the picture came from, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I got to see this guy from his his vocal side first. I didn't even know he played guitar at the time. I right? didn't even play guitar. Oh, you didn't? No. I didn't realize that. I was strictly that, so. well. <laughs> vocals, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and, and yeah, it still does. A killer voice, right? And um, the girls all swooned over him because of that <laughs> face and a whole bit, right? Know. Which is kind of cool, man, you know. But <laughs> I, I remember the first time you guys came down to my, my studio at the house, right mm -hmm. and uh, i i was your manager at the time mm -hmm. and uh we used to do an old meets the new and part of our show was kind of cool because bubba and jibbo and i came out and sang a little bit of acapella when they were getting ready to do their thing and then they would answer us I, it was one of the drifter songs I mm, forget, okay. under the boardwalk i think it was yeah yes you yes. know mm -hmm. and uh, and we would start it off and then all of a sudden their voices came in with a newer sound yeah. to under the boardwalk and we went back and forth yeah. but that's how i first got to meet mark mm -hmm. and then awesome. since then your career is like taken off brother i remember the very first time i actually met you too and some of the guys in for real they already knew you yeah and so we went over to meet you it was in the north side somewhere we were outside of a storefront i may have been a rehearsal space you had i can't remember yeah. but it was snowing you had like a long like trench coat it was like i think it was like beige and we all started singing and i just remember your falsetto was super high <laughs> you were killing it i'm like oh my god this is weird you know in a good way because i've known you i've yeah. known of you your big name in pittsburgh you know and then you're I'm, we're singing with you and that's that was the first time we we met in yes. person. It was yes. very, yes. you know, I, I'll never forget. It burned in my mind. It's fun yeah. stuff, man. And, oh yeah. And then, uh, so then we're gonna play a little game with you if it's all right. Sure. Okay. It's it's it's, it's, it's Byron, why don't you kick it off? All right. Okay. So we have this uh, thing that we like to do with the guests: it's something old, something new, something treasured, treasured, something true. So let's start with something old. Triggers a music memory. All right. Something for you. Something old uh, that happened. It actually happened this morning, which would spring this memory. Uh, my girlfriend was coming back from her spin class and she said she was listening to the Casey Kasem's, um, you know, countdown. And it was from 1983. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like, <laughs> I remember listening to, to that every week, you know, every week. That was a staple in our household mm -hmm. every week. And also B94 every night, the top eight at eight. Mm -hmm. We would listen to that every night and we would sit there and we would just hope our song was number one or stayed at number one. Yeah. And I can't tell you, my brother, he won. He was the, the 10th caller. He won at least 23, 24 <laughs> times. He was the number one. He was the 10th caller. Yeah, and he great. won. And I think I won it three times. That's how much radio it did. was Impact. so important. It was. Yes. You know, and the music that was played on those stations, those are the songs that kind of molded my style. Yes. It was more top 40. So it, could, it was R&B. Yep. It was rock. 
um, it was pop. And so I draw from all of those artists and cool. that's kind of how, you know, what my product is. I think it's just a, cl it's a combination of all those sounds. Yeah, back well, at that time, especially like you, it wasn't uncommon to hear Madonna, Styx, mm -hmm. Prince, Michael Jackson, that you would hear like Human League or Duran Duran, like that was all smushed together. Yeah. And that was sort of the cool part about radio, even though it still had its like barriers and was broken down. It was still pretty vast yeah, for the artists that you could get into, mm -hmm. you know. All right, let's it's shoot for the next something one. Something new. Something new. All right. Uh, lately, I've been really into, and this isn't even music related. It's, okay. <laughs> yes. it's podcasts, and it's it's a, a crime, true crime <clears throat> stories. So I love Datelines. Mm. I love 48 <laughs> Hours. I love 2020. And there was a, there's a great show on Hulu right now um, that I just got into. It's called Only Murders in the Building with Martin Short and... Steve Martin and Selena Gomez, mm. and they have a, a podcast in this show yes. about a true crime that happened in their uh, New York apartment building. Mm. So, I mean, I've just—it's one of those guilty pleasures for me. I get mad when my DVR tapes a repeat. I'm like, ah, oh. oh, man, <laughs> I already know this one. Hey, I'm watching the news. I'm like, that's gonna be a big one. That's gonna be good. How about know, uh, something like treasured? A, something treasured would be there's a there's a a bunch of things I could probably talk about, but as far as my music career to this point but i think opening up for edwin mccain was such a big moment for me because i remember seeing him about 20 25 years ago at rosebuds down mm. in the strip and at the time i was only a singer i wasn't really playing yeah. guitar or anything and you know he got up he had the big hit i'll be yep and also couldn't ask for more although diane warren wrote that song but he wrote i'll be and i just when i saw him live and and I saw him about three times, but after the, the very first time I saw him down there, I just, I'm like, I want to do that. I want to write. Yes. I want to play. Yeah. I don't want to depend. I, I was so dependent on other people to sing with, yeah. to harmonize with, getting instrumental soundtracks. And I had just picked up the guitar, and I knew I knew a little bit, but that's that's where it all started, where I wanted to be a songwriter, mm. and, and it made me want to get better at the guitar yes. and get better. So fast forward, I opened for this for him 20 years later, you know. Nice. And and then talking to him backstage, he was so nice. He wasn't in a rush. He leaned against the wall and he was just he he wanted to talk. Yes. You know? Yes. And here's me. I'm actually telling him, he, I'm like, you so you still writing and you still doing some um, you know, what what's your drive anymore with this? And he's like, uh, you could tell he's just <laughs> I don't know, like the way music is today and it's like you kind of get filtered out after a while, you know, things like that. I'm like, "Hey, uh, here's me like consoling him like you did it already. <laughs> you don't have to prove anything. Yeah. You know, yeah. you did it. All but, right. Yeah, so that was it. And this it for him to listen. This one I got to throw at you because yeah. this one's going to take something true, something nobody knows about Mark. Something true. Maybe some people don't know that I'm a school teacher. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I teach health and physical education at a five, six middle school. So that's, that is my, my day job. Um, I say I'm a I'm a I'm a singer who teaches instead That's of a nice. teacher who sings. That's but you know, I, you know what I mean. I, I love teaching. I love the kids. Believe me, I put it all out there when I'm there. Um, but yeah, that's that's something that most people don't know. If they just saw me at a show, mm -hmm. they would never think that I nice. was a teacher during the day. They probably thought I'm just struggling artist, or he's just yeah. writing and recording all the mm -hmm. time. You know. Awesome. Yeah. Well, what we want to do now, if it's okay. We want to do some jamming together. Is yeah. Right? So we, we, we're just going to get together and do a little bit of off the cuff, right? Yes. And uh, just the three of us. All right. All right. Let's do it.
See you out there.